Amen. All right, let's begin in verse number 8. That's going to be the beginning of our text this evening. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And then verse number 13, And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. We're going to take a brief intermission from uh, our Bible study on end times Bible prophecy on Sunday evenings. We're going to pick it back up next week. But this evening I'm going to be preaching a different style of sermon, a different type of sermon, uh, not on that particular topic. The title of the sermon this evening is Support Your Pastor. Support Your Pastor. Now it's interesting here when we look at this chapter in, in uh, uh, Exodus chapter number 17, uh, it's interesting the picture that is painted. It's a very very, very clear uh, 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 picture, or if you will, symbolism of a New Testament truth. And what I'm going to be doing this evening is I'm going to be going through mostly the New Testament, almost exclusively the New Testament, and giving you biblical principles on the practicality of supporting your pastor and why it is important. Now, when I say that at the very beginning, you know, uh, I make that statement, supporting your pastor, or why you should support your pastor. Anytime anyone that is a pastor that says, hey, you should support a pastor, of course people are going to attack them. But even before I was a pastor, I believed in supporting your pastor. And all the ways that I went through, it's a biblical principle. The pastor is supposed to be the one that preaches from the pulpit. He's supposed to preach the whole counsel of God. And one of the things that I should preach on that the Bible teaches is the importance of supporting your pastor. That's exactly what we have taking place here in Exodus chapter number 16. The pastor of the, the church in the wilderness. We know that the, the, the children of Israel, they were referred to as the church in the wilderness. And a church is a congregation. That's what we have here. We have a congregation. We have a church. That's what we have here. We're of Israel even in the spiritual sense. Amen. So there was the church of Israel. There was the congregation of Israel, the church in the wilderness. And that church had a pastor. Yes, it... <coughs> There was, a, there was a literal pastor of that church. He's referred to as a shepherd. That's all that the word pastor means. And I'm not going to go to the book of Numbers and demonstrate this right now. I've, I've shown that and proved that before in other sermons. But Moses was a literal pastor of the church. He was the shepherd. He was the leader, the physical leader of the nation, if you will. But he was also the spiritual leader. That was his job. He was the spiritual leader of the congregation. Moses was the pastor of the church in the wilderness. What happens here in this passage is they're, they're going forth to fight against Amalek. Amalek's a nation that comes out to fight against them because the, you know, the children of Israel are a mass group of people. They're encroaching upon their land and they feel threatened. So they come out and they uh, you know, uh, 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 set and encamp themselves against Israel. When they do so, God gives very specific a very specific command to Moses. He tells Moses to command Joshua to lead the troops. But then he tells Moses himself to go up to the top of the hill. He wants him to go up to the top of the hill or the top of a mountain, if you will. And he's supposed to go up there with Aaron and Hur while they fight, while the men of Israel and while Joshua leads them in this battle. When they go up there, the Bible says that in order for them to prevail, in order for Israel to win, Moses has to hold his staff up. He's got to hold his staff or his rod, the same you know, rod that he had that he turned into a serpent in the sight of Pharaoh and Janus and Jamborees. He's supposed to take that rod or take that staff and hold it up. This shows the responsibility of the pastor. This shows the responsibility of the man of God who, or the shepherd who leads the church. So he's holding up his staff. He's commanded to hold up his staff. And when he does so, it tells us in verse number 11, it says, And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevail. So notice when the, the pastor is doing what he's supposed to be doing, when the pastor is 
is following God's commandments. We see that the church is following God's commandments. We see that the church is prevailing, that the church is successful. It shows the importance of Leadership. Oftentimes when a pastor goes downhill, the church goes downhill. There's a, there's a, a great weight upon the shoulders of a pastor and he sets the example for the entire church. A lot of times when the pastor dies, if it's a great man, that man dies and you'll see somebody else step in, the whole church just goes to hell in a handbasket. The reason why is because leadership is extremely important. This is in all areas of life. If you look at a family, if the man fails as a leader in the household, the whole household crumbles. If you look at a company, if it's, there's poor leadership or poor supervision, the whole company fails. So there is a, there is a great you know, uh, 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 importance or significance when it comes to the leadership. So this, this represents the responsibility or the importance of having a good leader and the, and the man which is in the position of leadership, the pastor following God's commandments. Then we see, it says at the end of verse 11, it says, And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Then it says in verse 12, this is what I want to focus on, But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. So notice, <coughs> they go get a stone, they bring this stone over here, and they put the stone under him. And it says, And he sat thereon. And Aaron and her stayed up his hands. What that means is they held up his hands. The, there is a great responsibility that comes with being a pastor. There's a great importance or a great significance that comes with being a pastor. And if a pastor fails, the church will fail. He sets the tone. He sets the example. Whatever spirit the pastor has, that's the spirit that the people are going to have. There is a great importance that comes with being a pastor, being a leader in general. And right here what we see is we see when he becomes tired, when he becomes heavy, we see that Aaron and her come over and they put this stone under him. Now why did he become tired? Why did he become heavy? Because the role of a pastor is very difficult. The role of a pastor is very, very hard. And I can attest to this myself. It's much, much more difficult than I thought. You know what it does is it wears you down. It causes you to become very, very weary. That's what it is. And that's what you see here is, is the responsibility and the setting of the tone, the setting of the example. When he does what he's supposed to do, they prevail. When he does it, all the people fail. Notice all of the weight on his shoulders in this, in this situation. It's all left up to him in that, in that sense, and that responsibility, right? It's all given to him. But I want you to notice that there, become, there comes a time when the pastor or the shepherd becomes weary, and he becomes tired. He's, his hands, it says, become heavy. And this is going to be true with every pastor. I pastor a very small church, and let me tell you, it's, I'm glad that the church didn't start off with 200 people because I would have pulled my hair out. You know, I wouldn't have been able to, you know, I hope that I would have been able to handle it. Let me word it that way. It, just because it's a very, very difficult task. And obviously, I'm working a secular job on top of that, so that compounds, you know, the, the problem as far as how much work and how difficult it is to juggle all of these things. It's very difficult, and with this responsibility, of, of, of having to lead the church, he becomes very heavy. Do you know what happens is two men come over there, and this works out perfect, right? Wasn't even planned for that sense. But two men come over, Aaron and her, and it says, and they, they, they placed a rock under him, and he sits down when he becomes weary, and it says they stayed up his hands. And I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but it is a perfect picture of the people in the church, of the congregation in the church, supporting their pastor. Supporting their pastor. They come over, and I love these great pictures in the Old Testament that you can find of, of just of great truths that, that, are, that are biblically taught in the New Testament. They come over, and the pastor's heavy. The pastor's tired. The pastor's worn out with his job. He's having to hold his hands up and work all the time. And they come over, and they are the ones that bring the rock over. They're the ones, if you read the passage, that come up with this idea. It doesn't mention Moses saying, hey, go, go get me a rock. It says they brought him a rock. They brought him a rock. They placed the rock there. And he sat down upon it. And then they said, hey, we'll help you do it. Because here's the thing. Yes, leadership sets the example. Leadership paves the way. Leadership and the pastor is the one that's going to have, it's going to set the spirit for the church. But here's the thing. Everything does not fall and rise upon leadership. Now, I've heard people say that, and hey, there's a massive amount that does. There is a huge amount. That's just the truth. 
There's a huge amount that does fall upon the leadership. But if it's only leadership, you'll fail. Because there comes a time when the pastor's weary. Not only that, the pastor can only do so much. There's no way that I could knock every door in Jacksonville. It's not even possible. And if you ever, if, if, if any pastor ever thought that he could do that, that's insane, that's crazy, you will, he won't be successful. That's not how the church is designed. That's not how it works. There has to be church members. There has to be everyone collectively coming together and doing the work. And the pastor can only do so much. But he still is the leader. And there, and there is a biblical office. And it is a biblical truth that God has set men in the position to be the shepherd or to be the pastor of the church. And it's very important if we are to be successful, if we are to prevail over Amalek, if we are to defeat the world, and if we are to conquer and be victorious here at Valiant Baptist Church, it's very, very important that the church members support the pastor. That's not only here. That's, this is a truth that is true for every, for every New Testament church. And what I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to go through different ways in which you can support your pastor. Different ways in which you will help and benefit your pastor. And it will cause us to prevail. It will cause us to be victorious. It will cause us to, in leaps and bounds, be successful spiritually. I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. <clears throat> I have these in no particular order, uh, so we're just going to go through. I, I believe I have five. One, two, three, four. I have five points that uh, are going to be very practical. I believe all of them are pretty much found <coughs> in the New Testament. All of them are found in the New Testament. Of just points and way in which you support, should support your pastor. Now, these are all found biblically. None of these are like, hey, you know... Uh, these are the ways in which I want you to help me. No, these are biblical truths. It's a biblical principle. It's not just I'm a pastor, that's why I'm preaching it. It's a biblical principle. It's biblical. It's a, it's, it's a truth that's taught, and it is a, it's a part of the recipe in order to be a successful church. How to support the pastor. Now, here in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, we're going to begin in verse number 12, but our first point here is to respect the pastor, respect the office of the bishop. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. I want you to look with me at verse number 12. It says this, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Once you notice a couple of things it points out. Number one, it says those that labor among you. The pastor's the one that should be doing the majority of the work. They're the one laboring. Notice they're the ones that labor among you. They're the ones that do the work. And then it goes on and it says, and are over you in the Lord. That's speaking about them being a ruler. This is talking about a bishop or this is talking about, you could even say, a deacon. So this is speaking about, let's say, a pastor, right? Those that are over you in the Lord. And it says, and admonish you. What is that referring to? It's those that <coughs> preach the word of God. It's those that are feeding the sheep. That's why they're called a shepherd. Then it says in verse number 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. So it mentions their work again as well, but it says to esteem them very highly in love. What does it mean to esteem someone? What, is, what does that mean? What's another way we would say that? It would mean to respect them, wouldn't it? It would mean to respect them, it says, very highly in love for their work's sake. It is a biblical principle to respect your pastor. It is a biblical principle. I've always done this. I ha and I still have to this day. My pastor, just because that's just how I think of it, and I think of him as my pastor still, in the way I, would, I just worded that. My pastor, Pastor Dave, I respected very much. He was a great man of God. I respected him very much when I sat under him. I learned from him. I listened to what you know, he taught. And I, I disagreed with him on doctrine you know, quite often. You know, there were things that I disagreed with. You know, he's more so of a hyper-dispensationalist. But I learned. He knew the Bible way better than I did at that time. I still, even though I disagreed with him on things, I learned so much from him. I esteemed his words very highly. They were very important to me. I, I looked up to, and I, and I even, you could say, probably reverenced his the uh, uh, advice that he would give to me. You know, I looked up to him, and you know what I did was I respected him. I respected my pastor. We as Christians, and, and, and those as are, that are church members, we should respect pastors. Now, even myself, 
I still respect other pastors. You know, I just respect, you know why? It's because I respect the office of a bishop. It is a, it is a set-apart job that God has ordained. This is an office in the local New Testament church, just like we should respect the local New Testament church in general. We should respect the office of a bishop, or we should respect the office of a, of a pastor. We should also respect the office of a deacon. That's, I believe, very important. So, we should esteem pastors <coughs> highly, and that means to... Have a high respect for your pastor. I want you to turn over to Hebrews chapter number 13, a way in which that we can esteem our pastors. Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number uh, 7 first. It, there's a couple of <coughs> verses that are found in this chapter that we can learn from in this regard. Look at verse number 7. It says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. Notice that's like admonishing you, right? This is talking about the shepherd. He feeds the sheep. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. Whose faith follow? Notice, the, they're meant to be an example. Considering the end of their conversation. That's talking about like looking at them as, as an example. You know, if, if you need to uh, uh, you know, look at the pastor and, and, and look at his life and the way in which he lives and look for an example in his life. The man that's plugged into that position, that's been installed into that position, he should be qualified for the position. And let me go ahead now, and you know, it would have been good to do this earlier, but this is fine. I'm going to give a disclaimer. Obviously right now, I'm not speaking about men that are not qualified to be a pastor. I'm not talking about people that have, that have dishonored or shamed the office of a bishop. I'm talking about men that meet the qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter number 3 that are laid out in the Bible. You know, the very clear qualifications, men that you know, that, that are, are capable of ruling and they, you know, uh, would be characterized as 1 Timothy 3. That's what I'm speaking about this evening. That is who would be uh, uh, worthy of respect. Look, let's look at, uh, excuse me, verse number 17 as well. Let's look at verse number 17 in this chapter also. It says this, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. We're going to come back to that later and focus on something differently. But another way in which you can uh, respect your pastor is by submitting unto your pastor, by submitting unto the authority <coughs> that your pastor... <coughs> has. Don't try to challenge your pastor. And this doesn't just go for you guys, like I'm saying. This is, this is just a biblical principle. You know, you should never try to challenge your pastor. You never should try to challenge the pastor's authority or challenge the authority that he has. There shouldn't be like, a, like an unspoken mental struggle that goes on between, you know, the power that the pastor has, where you're trying to one-up the pastor. You should respect the authority that the pastor has. You should just have a respect for the office of of the bishop in general, even if you, even if there's something about the man, whoever it is, that you don't disagree with, which there's going to be things about everybody you don't agree with. Let me just go ahead and tell you that. No man is perfect. Moses, I'm sure, had a plethora of problems, right? But even still, you should respect the office of a bishop, the man that is installed into that position, because it's the position also that you are respecting. Uh, and one thing as well is this. This is very important and relevant. Don't criticize the pastor. This is true no matter what church church you go to. It doesn't matter whether it's about me or not. Let me keep saying that because that's it's, it's irritating when people try to act like, you know, well, you're only saying that because you're a pastor. No, I'm not. I'm saying that because it's, it's something biblical. The Bible says to esteem pastors highly, very highly, right? So this is a way in which you're to respect your pastor. That's the exact opposite of respecting your pastor. You shouldn't criticize your pastor. You know, I have issues. I have flaws. Of course I do. The, the man that I sat under, that you guys sat under, he had quite a few flaws. I have quite a few flaws. You're never going to find anyone that doesn't have flaws. They're all going to have flaws. Every man is going to have flaws. We're all sinful. But what matters is that you meet the qualifications. That's what matters. What matters is that you're a man that, is, that you can look to to follow as an example. That's what matters. Don't criticize your pastor. Don't criticize his decisions that he makes at the church. You shouldn't criticize his preaching. Now, I'm not talking about doctrine. You can disagree with me. I'm not saying, hey, don't, don't ever disagree with anything that I said. I don't want you to be like that. that. I don't want people in my church that 
you know, just, they just believe every last thing that I say. That is not right. That's not biblical. And I want to have a biblical church and I want, I want what's best for you guys and I want you to be strong Christians. And if you're not uh, uh, you know, listening to what I'm saying and actually trying it and proving it with Scripture, you're not going to be a strong Christian. You're going to be a very weak Christian that's just... Because once I'm gone, and, and, and uh, number one, all the areas that I'm wrong on, you're going to be wrong on. Now there's no chance of you fixing that. And then number two, once I'm gone, what if somebody else is put in that position that's just ten times worse than I am? You're just going to continue down the same pattern, just believe whatever he says, and he's going to destroy you and him both. That's why it's important you can't depend, just solely depend on everything that the pastor says. You have to try what is spoken, you have to prove it, you know, and, and, and make sure that it is true. So, I'm not saying don't disagree with the doctrine that I preach. Of course, sometimes I'm going to be wrong, and if I'm wrong, then you can disagree with me. You know, you should disagree with me if I'm wrong. But what I am saying is, there's no need to go around and try to, and, and specifically try to, like that's your purpose, try to criticize something that I'm wrong about, or try to criticize me, or criticize my preaching, or just talk bad about my, uh, my preaching, or talk bad about maybe flaws that I have. These are all things that I believe are sinful, and that is exactly opposite of what is being spoken in the spirit that is being spoken of here. You're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to highly esteem, you know, those that labor in the Word of God. You're supposed to highly respect them, and you shouldn't go around. And number two, it's this: it's not healthy just to criticize a leader. That's not healthy for all the people because what you do is you spread that negativity to everybody. And then everybody has this negative. Have you ever thought very highly of someone and then someone comes to you and then they're just like, have you ever noticed this about that person? And then you just look at that person totally differently. That's what happens when you do that. I, you know, Brother Rick and Brother Hall have flaws. And I could go to Brother Hall and just pump his mind full with the flaws that Brother Rick has. And I could do the same thing to Brother Rick about Brother Hall. And I could change your perception in the way in which you look at each other. And I could make you think that that person has all these problems, right? Or the other guy has all these issues. That's the same exact thing. Anybody could come to you and try to make you look at somebody like, hey, and just in inflate the issues that they have. But, but we're, we're all sinful. We all have our own issues, right? As long as they're not like a glaring problem, like where you are not meeting the qualifications... If it's just some sort of character flaw that someone has or maybe something, a decision that someone made that maybe you disagree with, keep that to yourself. Keep that to yourself. If you disagree with decisions that I make, I don't think that it's right to go around and talk to other people about that. Number one, what would be achieved from that? What's the point? Just to tell them why you think they're wrong to try to lift yourself up. That's why people do that most of the time. When someone goes, another employee goes to a, 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 a co-employee and they want to talk bad about their boss, when they do so, they're complaining about the bad decision because they're saying, this is the connotation or this is the implication. I would have made a better decision. I would have made a better decision than he did. Now, you know, uh, myself personally, I had never pastored before I pastored this church, but I had been in ministries for quite a while, for a very long time. So I do have a lot of experience when it comes to ministries. I didn't have any experience when it came to pastoring a church. And I do have a lot of experience when it comes to management. You know, ever since I was around 21, I had been in management. I had worked as a supervisor. So I even still, just personally myself, a lot of other pastors don't have that experience. So I, that is actually something that I have as an advantage. And that is, you know, being a supervisor, being a manager, I know how to lead in, in that area. But here's the thing. I'm, you may do the same thing too. And we, if we were encountered with, a, with, with a, uh, uh, an obstacle or a decision that need, needed to be made, let's say that you thought that I should have made a different decision. And let's say that you were right, right? You should still keep that to yourself. That's my point. Right. You should still keep that to yourself because here's this is what it comes down to. I'm the boss of the church and you're not. It's the same thing that goes with a husband and a wife. And the only thing that would come out of that if you went and spoke to another person and criticized your pastor is something bad. That's it. Did you go to them to try to tell them that, hey, you needed to come talk to the pastor about it to, to, to try to help the situation? Or was it just to talk about it? That's gossiping. That's backbiting. That's not good. That's harmful and it's injurious. So it's important. One of the main things about respecting your pastor, I believe, is not criticizing him, especially not criticizing him behind his back. If you have a, a legitimate problem, please bring it to me. 
please bring it to me. I would be more than happy to speak to you. You know, if you wanted to talk to me about something you thought that I should. And you know what? If, if you maybe have a, a, a different perspective or a different angle on something, you might be able to give me good advice about something. I have no problem with you coming to me and telling me, you know, uh, giving me advice on a, on a particular issue. But don't criticize your pastor behind his back. Submit to your pastor's authority. Don't try to challenge your pastor, one-up your pastor. You know, have like this unspoken power struggle with your pastor. It's a, it's a rightful position. It's an authority that comes with the position. Respect the authority that comes with the office. God desires for the pastor to have that office, that, that power, not you. That's what it comes down to. Think about the way that I worded that. God desires for the pastor to have that authority, not you. He doesn't want you making decisions. That's a powerful statement. So that is the reason why... You should do that. That is the reason why you should submit to your pastor's authority. The Bible plainly tells you esteem him highly. Verbally respect your pastor. Respect your pastor in conversation. If you disagree with your pastor, uh, uh, respect him <coughs> verbally. I believe in calling the pastor pastor. I'm not saying you always have to call me pastor. I'm not against you calling me something else. I call pastors pastor, and I'll call them brother too sometimes too, but I believe it's respectful. That's the reason why. You know, I think it's good to call your pastor pastor, especially when there's a lot of visitors or someone new. I think it's very a very good idea to make sure that you refer to the pastor as pastor because it sets the tone for that person understanding that people respect the pastor. If you go to a church where people call the pastor pastor, I guarantee you that those people respect their pastor. If you go to a church where everybody just calls the pastor by the first name, they may respect respect him to a degree, but it they would respect him even more if they called him pastor. Now, I'm not saying, hey, you can never call me Tyler. I don't mind if you call me Tyler. But I am saying this, that, that it's not a commandment to call me pastor. It's 100% not a commandment. But it is respectful. It shows respect to call the pastor pastor. You call me Brother Baker, and you can tell it doesn't bother me. I don't care slightly, but it's respectful to call the pastor pastor. That's why I call other pastors pastor as well. Uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. Now this, <coughs> this point that I'm getting ready to bring up right now, I spoke about when I, I went to tithing, so uh, when I preached about tithing. This is not necessarily applicable to us, it just falls into the, into the uh, truth of tithing. Uh, but this is something that is very clearly taught, and it's actually like probably with the wording and this exact uh, uh, um, example, it's probably the closest example to what supporting the pastor means. And it is financially supporting your pastor. Now when you, when you, you know, give to the church... The tithe in the Old Testament was for the priest. Now, I don't take a check, and that's not what I'm saying. Hey, I need to start getting paid, guys. That's not what I mean. I'm teaching biblical principles right now. That's the point of this. And one of the reasons why in the New Testament they make sure they say to give, one of the reasons why in the Old Testament they said make sure to give was to make sure that the priest was able to stay in that office and do that work so that he could work for God and not have to go get a secular job. Remember the passage where when Nehemiah comes and they're all, they've all left of their field and he's crying and weeping because no one's there to serve at the house of God. It's sad. It's very sad. Well, the same thing goes in the New Testament. I wish we could bring enough people in here that believe like we believe and I could work full time. We could have 50 people working full time and just do a ton of work. Right? That's a biblical principle. It tells us in 1 Timothy chapter number 5, verse number 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now there, you know, it tells us to be counted worthy of double honor. You know, the way in which we think of honor is a little bit different today, just like honoring someone, right? But right here, of course, it would encompass both of them, this teaching. But it's also specifically referring to a way in which you would honor the pastor, and that is by... You know, uh, 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 paying to the church, and of course that would go to the pastor. Paying him for his labor, or rewarding him for his labor. That's why it says at the end of verse 17, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Then it says in verse 18, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is, the, is worthy of his reward. So what does it mean that he's worthy of double honor? What well, it tells you. That's why it says, for the scripture saith, because the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Obviously the ox, if he's going to labor and tread out all that, all that corn, he, it, you shouldn't put a muzzle on his face. He, it, the, the labor that he is you know, uh, uh, involved in, he deserves to be paid back for it. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. The labor that the pastor does, he deserves to be paid for it. <clears throat> 
As I said, let me reiterate, I don't get paid and I'm not going to take a check from the church until I'm able to go full time. I have a secular job and I do, you know, I'm, I'm successful in my career and, and, and I will throw that out the, the door and out the window as soon as I'm able to come full time at the church. And I told my wife, if it gets to the point where I can kind of see that the finances will work, and we gotta eat, she knows what I'm getting ready to say, and we gotta eat like cheap rice and beans or something like that. We're coming, I'm working for the church. I'll downsize my lifestyle in a heartbeat if I could come full time on at the church. And uh, because that's what's important to me. It's not important to me <coughs> getting a lot of money. I don't wanna work for the church to be paid tons of money. I wanna work for the church to work for the Lord. I wanna work for the church so I can grow this church, so we can do bigger things for God. We can reach more people, we can impact people's lives spiritually in a good way for Christ. That's that's why I want to work for the church. And I, I would rather work for the church and live a much more humble life than I live now than to, you know, try to juggle two jobs and get a small paycheck from one place and a big paycheck from my job now and just make tons of money. I would much rather work for the church if I had to, you know, live a more humble life. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. <clears throat> this is taught as well here. And uh, it's talking about, you know, Pastors being paid or the laborer and spiritual things being paid. You know, he mentions in, uh, let's begin in verse number four. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Notice that word power. Have we not power to lead about a sister or wife as well as other apostles? There when he says power, he means right. Don't we have the right to this? Don't we have the right to that? Or I only in Barnabas. Have we not power to forbear working? Saying, don't I have the right to quit my secular job? That's what he's saying. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the <coughs> fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox, the mouth of the, of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? He's saying, was he saying that because he was worried about the oxen being fed? Verse 10, Where saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. For he that pl ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Then he says this in verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal thing. So it's very clearly talking about how he's preaching the word of God to them. He's helping them grow spiritually. He's teaching them how to go soul winning. He's helping them set up the functioning of the church and everything they're in. And it says that all of that work, that spiritual work, it's of a high value, right? We, we have a very high value on that. Isn't that comparable unto carnal things as well? I believe it's worth more and, but people have the opposite idea, right? People have the idea of, like, you know, the preaching of the Word of God, that's nothing. That's not important at all. That's not that important. Brother Hall preached a sermon a couple Wednesdays ago, and afterwards he was talking about, man, it was tiring. How long did you preach? Maybe 35 minutes. 35 minutes. And he's like, didn't you say you're like, man, it felt like I was preaching forever. Preaching is super tiring. It is. Writing a sermon is super difficult and tiring. It wears you out. It's super mentally stressful. Can you imagine? I cannot... There was a point after I started pastoring the church when like three, four months went by and I started realizing like, oh man, if I live to be 70, do you know how many sermons, sermon ideas and sermons I'm going to have to come up with for, for, you know, from now until 70 years old or 60 years old, however long that I... <laughs> that I continued preaching behind the pulpit, it's difficult to continually come up with topical sermons. You know, just over and over and over again. So your mind's just constantly racing. You obviously you need to be continually reading the Word of God, and that's where the, 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 you know, the ideas are going to come from. But it's still difficult. It's a very hard, it's a tasking job. It's very difficult. And that's what he's saying here. When you're sowing spiritual things, when you're doing this spiritual work, hey, you, 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 uh, you deserve to be paid for it. You deserve to be paid for it. You know, he goes on uh, in verse number 13, Do you not know that they which minister about the holy things live of the, whole, the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. We'll see this again, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. I'm going to read to you from Galatians chapter number 6. We'll see this taught again in Galatians chapter number 6. It says it, <coughs> verse number 6, let him that... Let, let him that is taught in the word, so this is the person that's being taught from the pastor, communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now communicate is talking about like a payment, like a reward as far as a, a, a reaping of a carnal thing like it said. Right? 
uh, that teacheth in all good things. So that is a, uh, a, a very strong biblical teaching in the New Testament. We'll see it, as all, we'll see it also here in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Let me get there myself. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, we're going to look at verse number 8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8. He says, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Now, we're, now look at verse 9. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Now I want you to notice what he said. Not that we don't have power. Right? What does he mean? Not that we didn't have the right, just like what he said in 1 Corinthians 9. He used the exact same wording. Now, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul explains that he personally chose this path just so that no one could ever try to, you know, attack the gospel because he's being paid for what he does. But the other people, they did have uh, they didn't have secular jobs. Paul was the only one that did this, and he went above and beyond. This is a way in which, as Christians, you know, we could be commanded to go above and beyond. This was an area in life where Paul chose to go above and beyond. He did all of his labor. He worked it. He worked night and day, and he and he worked as a tent maker. But then he also did just as much or more work than everybody else. And that's why he's like staying up all night and never sleeping and things like that. That was the life that Paul chose to use so that he might bring more people unto Christ. Paul was a spectacular, he was a, an exceptional man uh, uh, when we read about him in the New Testament. I want you to go now to Exodus chapter number 18. Exodus chapter number 18. The next point is take a load off of his shoulders. Just like we saw in Exodus 17. Exodus 17, this is not a coincidence, I believe. Uh, in Exodus 17, what was going on? His arms were become weary. He was becoming very tired. It says his arms were becoming heavy. So Moses was becoming heavy with his job that he was given as the pastor, as the leader, as the shepherd. And the, the congregation came over and what did they do? They held up his arms. They supported their pastor. They took a little bit of the load off of his shoulders. Your pastor gets tired. This is all pastors. I'm not just telling you, hey, I'm real tired guys, I need help. This is not like a subliminal message here. I'm just teaching the truths of the Bible. Your pastor gets tired. All pastors get tired tired. And it's very helpful if <coughs> the people in the church volunteer to do some work. If the people in the church will take a load off of the pastor's shoulders. Israel would have lost. They would have lost. When people say everything falls and rises on leadership, that's not true. Yeah, there's a big, there's a big chunk of it. But it's still left up to the people in the church as well. It's still left up, left up to everyone else in the congregation as well. If they do no work, if Aaron and Hur wouldn't have came over and picked up you know, Moses' arms, Israel still would have lost. So it wasn't just the man of God, Moses there, that was working, that, that he was doing everything. No, they would have lost. So it's very important that people in the church pick up some slack, that they do some work as well, that they try to volunteer and do things. And even children could do this as well. You know, even children, you know, all the sermons that I preach apply to the kids and things also. But children could look for opportunities to do things around the church and menial tasks and sweeping up and things like that. The very next chapter, we see the same thing happening. Moses becoming weary. Moses becoming tired with his job. Exodus chapter 18, I want you to look at verse number 13. Exodus 18, 13. <clears throat> And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening? Unto even. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God. And his laws... I'm sorry, and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. And then he says in verse 18, Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee, thou art not able to perform it, thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of the people 
able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure. And all this people shall also go to their place in peace. I want you to notice here that Moses has a huge job. Moses has a huge task. As a pastor of the church, it's a very big job. It's a stressful job. It's a tasking job. It's a burdensome job. It's very difficult for many reasons. Mentally, stressfully, you know, multiple reasons. And it, notice that his, his father-in-law comes here. Now, this wasn't specific <coughs> you know, uh, advice from God in this sense, but actually it's repeated later when Moses goes to God, and God actually gives the same advice. So Jethro gave the same advice that God would give. You know what Jethro told him was, hey, you know what you need to do is you need to, you need to stop trying to bear all the burdens yourself, because what's going to happen is you're surely going to wear away. What you need to do is you need to allow the people to bear the burdens with you. And this is the third way in which you can support your pastor. You can help take a load off of his shoulders. You can help take a load off his shirt and you can bear the burdens with your pastor. Volunteer to do things around the church. Uh, if you see a job that needs to be done, if you see something that maybe you're good at or you know how to do, volunteer to do it. Now obviously, you know, the pastor it needs to be doing the, the majority of the work and he's going to be laboring the most. He's the one that labors among you, right? But that doesn't mean that there aren't things for the people in the church to do. Of course there are jobs for the people in the church to do. I mean, soul winning. Everybody should be participating in soul winning as much as possible. But there's also work just around the church in general to do. There's all types of work that we could do around the church. Uh, anything that maybe you see me doing, and there may be things that I want to do myself, or I may tell you no, that I want to do it because, you know, uh, you know uh, maybe it's a certain skill set, or maybe I just enjoy doing it. But come to me and ask me, and look for opportunities opportunities to maybe bear a load. Now at this point, you know, there's not a ton of, of burdens, nothing compared to what Moses was going through, what we have here. Uh, but it, it, the, the principle is still true and it's still a good, it's, it would still be a good practicality that if you were able to do some small things here, some small things there, it would definitely take a load off of the pastor's Shoulders. I'm just going through all of these biblical points. These are all biblical ways. You keep these in your mind when the church does grow. Then it would become more you know, relevant to us here. But I wanted to go through all of these biblical points. Uh, the next point is this. A way in which you can support your pastor is defend your pastor. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. <clears throat> Pastors get attacked a lot. I'm sure everybody knows that here. Leaders, spiritual leaders, get attacked constantly. They get attacked by people outside of the congregation, from other churches, but they also get attacked by people in the churches. And sometimes it's people that love the pastor that maybe criticize the pastor, maybe say bad things about the pastor. You need to be someone that is a faithful man. You need to be someone that would defend the pastor. I don't believe that it's ever okay to talk bad about a pastor. Ever. Behind his back, ever. I don't think it's ever okay to talk bad about anybody. But it is worse if you're doing it about leadership. If you're, if you're going around to other people that go to the same church as you and talking bad about the leader of the church, who in their right mind would think that that's okay? Who in their right mind would think that that's good? Who in their right mind would think that something good is going to come out of this? This is going to bring forth good fruit. I'm sure I just you know, made him you know, uh, trust in the pastor more. Or I'm sure he's going to build a closer relationship. Or, I mean, what could possibly come out of something like that? If there's a legitimate problem, then go to the pastor. This is, so this is the exact opposite. This is the opposite of criticizing the pastor. You need to be defending your pastor. If you ever hear anyone criticizing the pastor, or let's say that the church grows and there's like, there's a couple other assistant pastors, anyone that would be fall into that position, anyone that's maybe a deacon, anyone that's in any position, you should never allow them to criticize leadership especially. Don't ever allow them to criticize anyone at the church. Number one, let me say that. But it's especially dangerous if they're going around and criticizing leadership. They are more directly attacking the church institution themselves. That's what they're doing. When someone starts attacking the leadership, they're not just attacking that person in individually. 
they're trying to by extension attack the church. And that's not good. That'll tear the church apart. That'll cause all sort of uh, uh, other problems. So you need to defend your pastor. I'll show you an example of this. Of course, Paul the Apostle wasn't directly a pastor. They're referred to as pastors and shepherds, not of at least one individual local uh, congregation. But he is, that position is called uh, the office of a bishopric, right? The, the office of a bishopric is what it's uh, uh, loosely referred to as in Acts, the book of Acts. So he had the job of being a shepherd. He had the job of being a bishop. And I want you to notice what it says in 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Look at verse number 14. It says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. That's an imprecatory prayer found here in the New Testament. And then it says in verse 15, Of whom be thou ware also? For he greatly withstood our words. So this man, when Paul went and preached, this man was, this man was greatly you know, standing against what Paul was preaching and Paul himself. Is he getting ready to die? It did die. Okay. Look at what it says in uh, verse number <clears throat> 16. I want you to notice what it says here. Speaking about Paul and when this man, Alexander the coppersmith, uh, did him much evil and said bad things about him. Then it says this in verse number 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me. I want you to notice that. So when Paul, Paul the Apostle, Paul the man of God, you know, the greatest man in the New Testament, he, he went and he was preaching and Alexander the coppersmith was there and he was standing against him and, and, and you know, he was opposing him. It says that when he did that and Paul responded to him, he says no man stood with him. Everybody forsook him. Nobody stood up for him. Everybody left him. When they could have been saying, hey, that's not all right, Alexander. That's not okay. They could have defended him. But you know what they did? They did the exact opposite. And it says, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I want you to notice that, how they were talking bad about him. Alexander the coppersmith was attacking him, and nobody defended Paul. Now, I believe, obviously, this is inspired by the Holy Ghost, but God used men to write this. And it would make sense that, number one, this is being used through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, but it would make sense that that still is in Paul's mind. That everybody left him and everybody forsook him. Wouldn't that bother you? Wouldn't that get to you and bother you if all the people that were supposed to be your friends or all the people that were supposed to be those that stood with you, if they just totally forsook you and didn't defend you? Wouldn't that bother you? I believe that's one of the reasons why this is brought up. Then he prays for them in a good way. He says, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. So, you know, he prayed the imprecatory prayer for Alexander the coppersmith, but then he made intercession for all of the, you know, those that would be, you know, his brethren, if you will. But notice how they, <coughs> they didn't defend Paul. Was it a good thing or a bad thing? He says, I pray that it wouldn't be laid to their charge. Notice they had something, a mark that could go on their account. This is not a good thing. Of course, you know, Paul was a leader. I'm sure he was attacked constantly. I'm sure he had people saying bad things about him constantly. I'm sure he was criticized all the time. All the time. Now, if, if there's something that the pastor does that's bad, as I've said a few times, this is very important. Go to the pastor himself and speak to him. Amen. Don't talk bad about the pastor. And if you ever hear anyone speaking bad about the pastor, you need to tell them, hey, you shouldn't talk you know, about bad about the pastor behind his back. That's not okay. We're commanded to respect the pastor or highly esteem the pastor. If you want to quote the verse, say, if you have a problem, you need to go speak to the pastor. And if this persists, you need to come tell the pastor. You need to let the pastor know. That doesn't make you a rat. That doesn't make you... You know what it makes you is a good person and a good friend to the pastor. If someone's going around, if someone's going around talking bad behind your back, you want somebody to go tell you. It's an issue that needs to be resolved. It's an issue that shouldn't be happening. And it's something that needs to be stopped. It will, because what will happen is that, that, that bitterness will fester and it will, it's a root of bitterness and it grows up and it blossoms and just continues to cause harm and, and problems. It's not okay to criticize the pastor. So, you know, everyone here, if that ever happens, you should tell the person to stop and if they do it again, tell the pastor. And then I will speak to the person and tell them that's not allowed here. That will not be tolerated. What it will do is turn the whole church against the pastor. That's what will happen. It will cause everyone to be evil-minded against the leadership of the church and then the church is just going to fall apart. That's what it is because the pastor is the leader of the church. There's much responsibility that comes with that. There's a major extension with that. I want you to turn, this is going to be the last point. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13. <clears throat> 
Lastly, and this somewhat ties in with that, that point there, or you know, a part of that context or scenario, don't, lastly, don't be a troublemaker. Be someone that is a faithful person that can be defended, or that can be uh, counted on, or depended upon. Don't be like an Achan, if you will, for Moses. Achan was a troublemaker for Moses, right? He caused troubles. They're, they're trying to figure out there's a plague that's starting because this guy is just, you know, not obeying the commandments. He's just causing trouble. He's actually called, you know, he's causing trouble. That's the way in which it's worded. Don't be a troublemaker in the church. Be a person that, uh, that is a faithful man and a man of integrity that, that stands with the church. Hey, I believe in loyalty to the church. Now, do I just believe in blind loyalty? No. Loyalty is just faithfulness. That's what loyalty is. It's being a faithful man. I believe that you should be very, very faithful and be loyal to your local church as long as the church is in the right, as long as the church is doing what's right in God's eyes, you should have you know, a faithful heart to your church. Look at Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 17. It says this, Obey them that have the rule over you, <clears throat> and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. Then it says, That they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. I want you to notice that it says that obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. And then it says, <coughs> for they watch for your souls. So looking out or watching for your souls are trying to you know, protect you and guide you the right way and protect the sheep. And it says, as they that must give account, it says this, that they may do it with joy. You know, you could be the, the cause of me either, you know, uh, uh, you know, enjoying the office of the bishop here at Valiant Baptist Church, or you could be, excuse me, the cause of me having to do it with grief. There are people that are church members that are just <clears throat> constantly causing grief. They're constantly causing problems in the, in the church. There are people, especially, a perfect example is this, is somebody that just loves drama. They're just constantly spreading drama. That person is oftentimes the gossiper. You know, then you could kind of separate that as well. You know, the person that's going around and they're gossiping about things. The person that loves drama. You know, uh, you know uh, the person that's kind of vindictive. That wants to always get somebody back for something that, that another person said to them, right? You know, the person that's kind of just the loud mouth and doesn't think about what they're saying. They're just constantly going around maybe running their mouths to people or something like that. You know, be a faithful church member. Be a church member. Be an asset to the church, not a liability. Be someone that's here and it's like, man, that guy's a good guy. Man, that woman is a good woman. She's a good godly woman or he's a good godly man. They benefit the church. They help the church. Be an asset, not a liability. You know, allow, you know, you could make, and this is a way, a perfect way in which to support the pastor. You could make, my, make me enjoy my job as a pastor, or you could make it grief. You could cause my job to grieve me as a pastor. And all these points, they all apply to uh, uh, all churches. It's not just our church. This is how all churches work. This is the operations of all churches. And uh, so, so be, be a person that can pass over a transgression. That's a good way to put it. A, a person that's not a troublemaker oftentimes is the person that can pass over a transgression. When somebody does you wrong, if it's small, just get over it. You don't got to complain about it and blow, blow it way out of proportion, right? <clears throat> just get over it. Be the person that is a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. You know, when there's, a, when there's an issue, try to resolve the issue. Not only just the times when you need to pass over the transgression, but endeavor to be a peacemaker if there's an issue that has happened. Try to bring back peace, right? Be an Aaron, let me end with this, be an Aaron and a her church member. Those are the two men that held the arms up. Be a church member that supports the pastor. So be a church member that supports the pastor and use these biblical principles in your life. And, and, and I'll end with this. I don't want to be the kind of pastor <clears throat> that is like untouchable, like a lot of pastors are. Where they try to make themselves untouchable. Where they think they live in like an ivory tower. You know, where they just like, they're, they're never friends with the people in the congregation. I don't believe that that's right. I don't, I don't desire that for myself. I don't want that at all. That's not the kind of, you know, uh, uh, pastor that I want to be at all. 
Now, I've been given advice from people that that's how you should be. I know that, that Hiles Anderson teaches that. I know a lot of pastors, that, you know, obviously they don't word it in the way in which I said, but they're like, hey, you need to keep distance you know, from the men in the church because if you get too close to them, and there is, a, there is a truth there. If you get too close to them, then they'll just totally just become, you know, they'll disrespect you. And there is a truth when, it, when, when the Bible, you know, or when we think about, you know, uh, maybe people like bosses, when they, you know, uh, grow close relationships with those that are, you know, they're the superior, but those that just work with them, right? Uh, it, it becomes easier to disrespect them, right? It does. That's why you have to, you as the church member, it's up to you to support your pastor in those ways. I want to have a close relationship. I want to be friends with the people at the church. I want to do that. You know, I want, I don't want to be this guy that's, you know, just, that's, you know, I leave immediately after the services. I'm just constantly all business, and you know what I mean? That's Pastor Baker to you, buddy. That's not how I want to be. I don't like that. That's not how I am. I'm a very you know, informal, just casual type of person. I like to have close relationships, and I love the men in this church, and I want to continue to have close relationships. But it's up to the people at the church to respect the office of the bishop. It's up to the people at the church to make sure that they maintain and they understand the way in which the Bible teaches to support your pastor and to respect your pastor. So I'm going to go over these, these, uh, these truths one more time. I'm just going to read them to you and then we're going to close in prayer. So this is much more of a practical sermon. I believe it will help us as a congregation moving forward and with our growth in the future. So number one is respect your pastor. Esteem him highly, the Bible says. One way to do that is to submit to your pastor's authority. God gave the pastor the authority and desires the pastor of the church to have the authority, not you. Don't criticize your pastor. You shouldn't go around criticizing your pastor, his decisions, or anything like that. You should verbally respect your pastor. Respect him in conversation. Respect his opinions. You know, look up to his opinions. Seek after advice from your pastor. A good way is calling him pastor. That doesn't mean, it's, I'm not saying it's a commandment. I'm not saying to do it all the time, but it's, it's respectful to refer to your pastor as pastor. Financially support your pastor. The way that you do that is by giving to the church. That's not relevant to us right now. Take a load off of his shoulders. Your pastor gets tired, just like Moses got tired. Look for work to do. Look for work around the church, maybe where you have a certain skill that you would be profitable to the church. Look for opportunities to do things like that. That's men and women. That's not just men. So volunteer to do some work. You know, be uh, consistent with the work. Be independent. <clears throat> uh, defend your pastor. If somebody ever talks bad about your pastor, you shouldn't allow that. Defend your pastor. Pastor, and then go tell your pastor if it persists because it will cause a problem if it continues. And then lastly, don't be a troublemaker. And the way to interpret that the best way is, you know, vice versa, or, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, with, the, with the comparison of the contrast, you would say this. Don't be a troublemaker. Don't be, don't be a liability, but rather be an asset to the church. Be someone that's faithful and dependable. Be an Aaron and a her church member. There are many different pastors out there. They're all going to have their flaws, you know, I have my flaws, you know, <coughs> every other pastor is going to have their flaws. You're never going to find anyone that doesn't have flaws, right? If you wanted to be super petty, you could pick out problems with every single person, right. every single pastor. All of that aside, God, didn't, God was not saying, I need perfect men with no sin, because they don't exist when he said, plug them into the position. But you know what God still told all of those church members? You need to highly esteem the men that I put into this position. That's important. It's not, it's not even necessarily about me. In the sense that I meet the qualifications, it is. But this is the point, though. It's God's qualifications. And if a man meets those qualifications, that's who we're speaking about. Those that don't, they don't apply. If they're in the position, they shouldn't be in it. But if a man meets those qualifications, whether it's me, who, who is your pastor directly at this church, or even a pastor at another church, you should, you should highly esteem that man, and you should support your pastor. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much for your just uh, 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 perfect, seamless system of the local New Testament church. We ask you, dear Lord, that we, would, uh, that we would implement it in the way in which it was meant, that we could get the full benefits out of it. We love you, and we ask you that you would be with us and bless us each day. Bless our church. Bless our congregation. Above all... Uh, bless all the families here spiritually and, bl and bless the church spiritually. We ask you that you would continue to be with us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.